Hey there, subscribe to my channel, and also press this bell icon so you never miss any new updates cause whenever we upload new video you will get a notification on your phone. Part 1 You will hear a woman talking on the telephone to a man about a car he is selling. First you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Hello, Brian Park speaking. Oh, hello. I'm calling about the advert in the paper. For the car? Uh, yes, the Mini you've got advertised for sale. Oh, yes. I just wanted to find out a bit more information. Of course. What would you like to know? It's my brother who's interested, actually. But he's not in today, so he asked me to call you. Fine. Great, thanks. So, it's a Mini? Yep. And how old is it? Just coming up to 13 years old. And I seem to remember from the ad that it's grey. That's it. Doesn't show the dirt. <laughs> Absolutely. Anyway, the colour shouldn't be a problem for Jeff. You know, the important thing is the quality. Yes, of course. And what about mileage? With it being pretty old, it's probably over 100,000? Actually, it's 40,000 less than that. 62,000 on the clock. Great. I remember now. I'm confusing it with another ad I was looking at. Right. Pleasant surprise, then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have you been the only owner, or was there a previous one? I'm the second one. Before, it was owned by a teacher, who was a very careful driver, didn't have any accidents. Very good. And what about you? What do you tend to use it for? I haven't used it all that much, mostly for shopping. You know, this sort of thing. So, not much wear and tear. I'll make a note of that. I know Jeff wanted me to check that. Right. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Now, about the price, I see you've got it down as £1,250. I'm not sure Jeff will be able to come up with that amount. In the ad, I did say £1,250 or nearest offer. So, would you be prepared to go down to £1,000? That's really too low, I'm afraid. £1,100? I might be able to go to that. OK, I'll make a note of that. What about tax? Is it due soon? Got another five months before it's due. Oh, that's a real plus, yes. I'll make a note of that. OK. Now, you say it's in good condition. For its age, I'd say yes, definitely. It's just been serviced and there were no major problems. Major? I'd be able to show you the service report. The only thing is, you'd have to get a new tyre in the near future. Though it's still OK, you know. It's certainly absolutely safe at the moment. OK, fair enough. Yes, I understand. And the garage also mentioned that one headlight could probably do with replacing. They think there's a fault there, you know, intermittent... Well, we'd obviously look at all the documents, but that sounds very straightforward. Of course. I've got all the service documents up to date and you can look at those. Well, it all sounds pretty good. And I know my brother will be interested, so would it be possible for him to see the car? He's back from his trip tomorrow, 
and away tonight. So, how about tomorrow? Tomorrow? Wednesday? I'm, I'm afraid that's not possible. I'm out pretty much all day. Well, Thursday then? That'd be fine, yeah. In the morning? Yes, that'd suit me perfectly. Great. Now, you'll need my address. Oh, yes, of course. What is it? It's number 238. 238? London Road. Oh, that's easy enough. Yes, very straightforward. So, I'll pass on these notes to Jeff, and he'll see you in a couple... That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a tour guide talking to her tour group. First, you will have time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Well, we certainly have a busy day ahead of us, so let's get started, shall we? You'll find a map of the museum with the itinerary I've just handed out. The museum's our first port of call, so uh, let's have a look at the map now. The door on the right of the entrance hall leads into the gift shop and ticket centre. Once we pick up our entrance tickets, I'd ask everyone to deposit their bags and coats in the cloakroom, which is located towards the back of the gift shop and ticket centre. If you want to pick up an information leaflet, you can approach the information desk situated along the right-hand side. Now, once you come back into the entrance hall, the door on the opposite side to the gift shop leads into the art gallery. There is a special exhibition on there at the moment which is not to be missed. If you continue on up the entrance hallway, that leads into the main exhibition centre. At the back left-hand side, there are some toilets. Beside the toilets, you'll find the 3D theatre. I strongly recommend that you make time for the 30-minute presentation in the theatre. It is well worth a viewing. Running along the right-hand side of the main exhibition centre is the Modern Art Studio. Here, not only can you view some of the most famous works of the 20th century, but you can also sit in on a workshop run by a local artist. So, that's the Art Museum. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Next on the itinerary is the aquarium. Depending on how long we spend at the museum, we might have to give this one a miss. It's not what I'd call a highlight of the day, but it would be a shame if we didn't get to see it, as it's en route to the Solheim Country Club, where we're booked in for lunch at one o'clock. 
Originally, we had planned to stop off at the Milltown Winery afterwards, but we've had to scrap that plan. Otherwise, we'd never get to the zoological gardens before closing time. We have pre-booked the gardens and must be there by 2.30, so no dilly-dallying, please, after lunch. Straight back onto the bus. The gardens close at 3.30, so we've an hour there which should give us ample time to look around. Time allowing, we'll stop off at the famous Stout Brewery after that, if traffic isn't too heavy, and we're in Lincoln before five. If not, we'll head straight for the National Concert Hall, where you're in for a real treat of an evening, with a performance from the world-renowned cellist Andrei Borovsky. We have to be in our seats by 6.30 sharp. After that, it's back to the hotel for the night where a buffet meal will be waiting for us at half eight, or whenever we get back. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two conversations. Are based on the following conversation. The answer should be appropriate to the content of this conversation. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Oh, hi Dave. Long time no see. Hi Maria. I just settled down. I thought I'd drop by. Come on in, take a seat. Would you like anything to drink? I have Sprite and orange juice. Sprite would be fine. Oh, so how have you been? Oh, not bad. And you? Oh. I'm doing okay, but school has been really busy these days, and I haven't had time to relax. By the way, what's your major? Hotel management. Well, what do you want to do once you graduate? Um, I haven't decided for sure, but I think I'd like to work for a hotel or travel agency in this area. How about you? Well, when I first started college, I wanted to major in French, but I realised I might have a hard time finding a job using the language, so I changed my major to computer science. With the right skills, landing a job in the computer industry shouldn't be too difficult. So, do you have a part-time job to support yourself through school? Well, fortunately for me, I received a four-year academic scholarship that pays for all of my tuition and books. Wow, that's great! Yeah, how about you? Are you working your way through school? Yeah, I work three times a week at a restaurant near campus. Oh, what do you do there? I'm a cook. How do you like your job? It's OK. The other workers are friendly and the pay isn't bad. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. 
Several days later, Dave and Maria met on campus. So, what do you want to do tomorrow? Well, let's look at this city guide here. Um, here's something interesting. Why don't we first visit the art museum in the morning? Okay, I like that idea. And、um, where do you want to have lunch? How about going to an Indian restaurant? The guide recommends one downtown, a few blocks from the museum. Now that sounds great. After that, what do you think about visiting the zoo? Well, it says here that there are some very unique animals not found anywhere else. Well, to tell the truth, I'm not really interested in going there. Yeah, why don't we go shopping instead? There are supposed to be some really nice places to pick up souvenirs. No, I don't think that's a good idea. We only have a few travelers' checks left, and I only have fifty dollars left in cash. No problem. We can use your credit card to pay for my clothes. Oh no! I remember the last time you used my credit card for your purchases. Oh well, let's take the subway down to the seashore and walk along the beach. Now that sounds like a wonderful plan. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute. To check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a part of a lecture about learning and bilingualism. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty, on pages forty-four and forty-five. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. When we look at theories of education and learning, we see a constant shifting of views as established theories are questioned and refined, or even replaced. And we can see this very clearly in the way that attitudes towards bilingualism have changed. Let's start with a definition of bilingualism. And for our purposes today, we can say it's the ability to communicate with the same degree of proficiency in at least two languages. Now, in practical terms, this might seem like a good thing, something we'd all like to be able to do. However, early research done with children in the USA, in fact, suggested that being bilingual interfered in some way with learning and with the development of their mental processes. And so, in those days, bilingualism was regarded as something to be avoided, and parents were encouraged to bring their children up as monolingual, just speaking one language. But this research, which took place in the early part of the 20th century, is now regarded as unsound for various reasons, mainly because it didn't take into account other factors such as the children's social and economic backgrounds. Now. In our last lecture, we were looking at some of the research that's been done into the way children learn, into their cognitive development, and in fact, we believe now that the relationship between bilingualism and cognitive development is actually a positive one. It turns out that cognitive skills such as problem solving, which don't seem at first glance to have anything to do with how many languages you speak, are better among bilingual children than monolingual ones. And quite recently, there's been some very interesting work done by Ellen Bialystok at York University in Canada. 
She's been doing various studies on the effects of bilingualism and her findings provide some evidence that they might apply to adults as well. They're not just restricted to children. So how do you go about investigating something like this? Well, Dr Bialystok used groups of monolingual and bilingual subjects aged from 30 right up to 88. For one experiment, she used a computer program which displayed either a red or a blue square on the screen. The coloured square could come up on either the left hand or the right hand side of the screen. If the square was blue, the subject had to press the left shift key on the keyboard and if the square was red, they had to press the right shift key. So they didn't have to react at all to the actual position of the square on the screen, just to the colour they saw. And she measured the subject's reaction times by recording how long it took them to press the shift key and how often they got it right. What she was particularly interested in was whether it took the subject longer to react when a square lit up on one side of the screen, say the left, and the subject had to press the shift key on the right-hand side. She'd expected that it would take more processing time than if a square lit up on the left and the candidates had to press a left key. This was because of a phenomenon known as the Simon effect, where basically the brain gets a bit confused because of conflicting demands being made on it. In this case, seeing something on the right and having to react on the left. And this causes a person's reaction times to slow down. The results of the experiment showed that the bilingual subjects responded more quickly than the monolingual ones. That was true both when the squares were on the correct side of the screen, so to speak, and even more so when they were not. So bilingual people were better able to deal with the Simon effect than the monolingual ones. So what's the explanation for this? Well, the results of the experiment suggest that bilingual people are better at ignoring information which is irrelevant to the task in hand and just concentrating on what's important. One suggestion given by Dr Bialystok was that it might be because someone who speaks two languages can suppress the activity of parts of the brain when it isn't needed. In particular, the part that processes whichever language isn't being used at that particular time. Well, she then went on to investigate that with a second experiment. But again, the bilingual group performed better. And what was particularly interesting, and this is, I think, why the experiments have received so much publicity, is that in all cases, the performance gap between monolinguals and bilinguals actually increased with age, which suggests that bilingualism protects the mind against decline. So, in some way, the lifelong experience of managing two languages may prevent some of the negative effects of ageing. So, that's a very different story from the early research. So, what are the implications of this for education? That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.